Aleluya. Aleluya. That's right. Aleluya. Praise the Lord. God is good all the time. And God is good today. Amen. Amen. God is good to me. And God is good to you. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Father, we just give thanks for this hour. Thank you for your presence in this house. Thank you for the, your presence in me and upon me. Thank you, Father, that this is an ordained hour in the name of Jesus for the preaching of the word of God. And there is an anointing on the word of God to move in the hearts of the people of God, to bring a deposit, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, to release power in the mighty name of Jesus, to bring enlightenment, yes, Lord, illumination. Thank you, Jesus. And there is the power for transformation in this hour of preaching. I want to thank you for your precious word. Thank you that Jesus himself is the word of God. And when we truly encounter the word of God, we encounter Jesus. So, Lord, I ask for a blessing upon each and every one of us. I ask for a blessing. Thank you, O Lord, for Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for moving this word, for depositing this word in my spirit, man, and in my soul. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that as this word comes out, my God, it will change me too. It will change us all. We bless you. We thank you. We receive you. In Jesus' awesome name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I wish that I had some music to dance to. I tell you, I'm feeling something bubbling inside me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, well, my word today is, how does your garden grow? Okay. And uh, when I was a little girl, and in fact, even now, I love nursery rhymes. Listen, I'm so into them. I remember them from way back when. Uh, I told them to my children. I read them, and I continue to enjoy them. Uh, and this one says, this one that I learned as a kid, it says, uh, this is what it says, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? with silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. And you know, nursery rhymes don't often make any sense at all. And that's the beauty of them because they are written for the rhyme and the rhythm. Okay, not really for the, the truth of it or anything. But the interesting thing is that they are such a gateway to imagination. Listen to this garden. This garden doesn't even have flowers or slugs or anything. What it has is what? Silver bells and cockle shells. That's imagination, right? That's imagination right there. And then it also has pretty maids all in a row. That's interesting. But, you know, I was really looking for a word for today, and I'd really been waiting on the Lord. And then suddenly it came. And I knew that this was the rhema for the day. So I feel confident about it because the way it came, it had to be God. Amen. Right now, we are in the garden season. Okay, today I dressed for the garden. Can you see my bright colors? <laughs> I thought I want to look like a garden today. And um, so we are in the garden season. And of course, uh, uh, people who are gardeners are working hard. People like me who are want to be gardeners, we are trying, okay? We are just trying, okay? And we thank God that, you know, as the season has evolved, we've been seeing color, we've been seeing color, we've been seeing color. You know, first of, first of all came in my garden, the few dandelions, um, not the dandelions, no, my, my, the first things to come was the daffodils. I think I have about four oddly spaced in the garden with really no rhyme or reason to, to the way they are spaced, but they did pop up, yellow flowers. Because I think when I was planting them, I didn't even know it was daffodils. I was just cold, it was in October, and Maureen had given me bulbs, and all I wanted to do was put them in the earth somewhere. So to my surprise, I have daffodils, and then of course, after them came the tulips, those that have survived, the squirrels and the chipmunks. Because I tell you, they've done a number on my tulips. So the ones that survived came up. And then, of course, 
the glory of my garden is my white peony. And that came up to, I just gave it a haircut today because all the flowers, you know, turn from white to brown, so I gave them all a haircut. So no more afro in my peonies. The afro's all been cut off, and it's just a green bush right now. But it came up. And then, you know, after the, oh, before then came the iris. Yes, the iris came, the peony, and then my little Stella de Oro, uh, which are tiny day lilies, they are blooming right now. And then my orange day lilies have also popped. So color after color, right? Orange, yellow, mauve, this and that, everything showing up. And so the garden season is a time that we pay attention, right? And so there's the big question, how does your garden grow? Amen. Now, I want you to take us to this idea that, you know, God himself is a gardener. When he created the world, he created a specific place called the Garden of Eden. And it was a beautiful place. And he popped the man and the woman in there, okay? And he gave them, he said, to what? Tend the garden. So you and I are created to be gardeners in the same way that our Heavenly Father is a gardener. Because when he put the man there, before he gave those majestic commands, be fruitful and multiply, he already said he put the man there to tend the garden. So we are tenders. We are supposed to tend stuff in life. We are supposed to tend our own hearts. We are supposed to tend our purpose, our families. We are supposed to pay attention, just like gardeners. Okay, so that is who we are in the image of our daddy God. Amen. Himself, a gardener. And I tell you, he was the landscaper in Eden, the horticulturist. I mean, he was everything there. And I think it must have been the most beautiful place that you ever saw. And ever since then, man has been trying to create, you know, those gardens in our lives. And when we were really young, you know, the seven wonders of the world, one was the hanging gardens of Babylon. So human beings have always loved gardens. We are made to garden. Hallelujah. So my big question today is how does your garden grow? Hallelujah. If we are supposed to be gardens, gardeners, creating gardens, then it's no surprise that when you look throughout the Bible, there are so many motives with a garden motive. You come across many, many things that have to do with gardens. You come across the seed, okay? You come, you come across the harvest. You come across uh, so many parables that Jesus even told that has to do with planting, has to do with harvesting and stuff like that. If you look through the garden, uh, the Bible, right from the Old Testament to the New, you will see that God consistently uses these motives of the garden, the gardener, things which are growing to teach us truths about himself, about his kingdom. Hallelujah. And he teaches us in such a way that we can understand. Some of these truths are like this. Be fruitful and multiply. Okay, that's a garden truth. Be fruitful and multiply. And indeed, it's amazing. You will plant your black-eyed Susans here, and by the next season, they are challenging every corner of your garden because they are trying to be what? Fruitful and multiply. And something like, you reap what you sow. That's also a principle in the Bible. What you sow is what you reap. So the gardener or the farmer has to be very careful and aware of what they are actually sowing, because that's what they're going to reap. Amen. And then the, another principle is the seed is in the fruit, and the fruit is in the seed. Everything, the fruit is inside the seed, and the seed is inside the fruit. So when you put a seed in the ground, in that seed, there are roots, there's a stem, there are leaves, there are flowers, and then there are fruits. Okay, so that principle is also a principle that is taught in the Bible, that the seed is in the fruit, and the fruit is in the seed. So that means that whatever we want to reap in our lives, we can have the wisdom to sow it, and it's going to happen. Because what the seed is in the fruit, and the fruit is in the seed. Then we have ideas like 
um, the, the scripture says in Zechariah 10, 1, ask for the rain in the time of rain. So that gives us the idea of seasons, rains coming down at specific times, at needed times for the garden to grow or for the farm to grow and to yield. Okay, so uh, the Bible says, ask for the rain. So we can't just sit and be placid uh, about the rain and say, oh, maybe it rained, maybe it didn't. It says, you ask for the rain. Okay, so there are principles like that. And also the principle of the rain cycle that God said his word is exactly like the rain. When it comes down, it will accomplish what it's supposed to do before it returns to him through evaporation. The water has to evaporate back into the clouds, right? And it will come down another day. In the same way, God says that's the way we actually uh, work with the word, that when he gives us the rhema, we are supposed to receive it in our hearts. We are supposed to speak it back to him. We are supposed to pray it and believe it. And in that return, that word is going to perform what it's supposed to do. So all of these things are in the Bible about gardening. In fact, it's a garden manual. That Bible is a garden manual, if you really look at it a certain way. You know, he talks about, uh, there's a parable that talks about how God sows and then the enemy comes in the night to sow tears. So that brings the concept of weeds. And I tell you, I struggle a lot with the weeds in my garden. Sometimes I don't know whether the weeds are winning or I'm winning. These days, mm, in certain parts, the weeds are winning, but in other parts, I'm winning, and I'm just waiting for the rain to fall, for the earth to be soft so I can get at the weeds again. Okay, but he tells us the weeds come too, so if we are good gardeners, we're going to have to watch out for the weeds and watch out to pull out the weeds. Amen. So all of this, these things are truths in the Bible, but they concern our lives because weeds are also sown into our lives. And we have to be aware of the weeds to be able to pull them out. Amen. Praise God. And so we learn all these things about uh, gardens or farms in the word of God. We learn all these things. We learn the chief of parables. A sower went out to sow. Everybody knows that. And when he sowed, the seed fell here and there and there and there. And wherever the seed fell, you know, it had an outcome. And most of the outcomes were bad. The only outcome that was good was the seed that fell on good soil. So that teaches us to pay attention to our own hearts. Do we have good soil in our hearts or our hearts in such a way that we cannot bear fruit based on the word of God that we are receiving? So God is a gardener. And so are you and so am I. And even though some people here may have more green thumbs, better green thumbs than others, I tell you, if we make the effort, we will see ourselves improve because I can tell you that I have improved over all these years. I tell you, I have a better understanding about my garden than I used to when I actually first started. And then the Bible also tells us about the mustard seed. That was the smallest seed that was planted. But when it grew up, it became the biggest tree and it had so many branches and leaves that even the birds of the air came to nest. And that gives us the principle that you can sow something very small. The kingdom of heaven, if you sow it, it can look very small. But when it has matured, it actually impacts and influences beyond your own life. Okay, it touches other people. Other people are encouraged, motivated. They are taught. They are influenced because you have allowed that tiny seed of the mustard seed to grow in you to affect your community. So these are all motives, and I know that there are more, but I just wanted you to see that this Bible is a gardening manual. And you know what? Sometimes we are the gardener and sometimes we are the seed and sometimes we are the plant. And you have to see yourself in all these ways as you read the Bible. My big question is how does your garden grow? And I know maybe some of you don't have gardens, but that's okay. There's a more important garden in our lives, right? There's a more important garden. So that's the garden I'm talking about. In answer to this question, the Lord gave me four points. The first one is the garden grows by sowing and planting. If you don't sow, you won't get a garden. If you don't plant, you will not get a garden. Okay, when we first moved to our home, we had a lawn. And then I cut a little piece and I planted a few plants. 
And every year, I cut a bit more. And my, you know, AD camp was Maureen sitting over there. We used to dig the lawn and plant stuff in there instead because we just didn't know how to manage the weeds in the lawn. So we just decided it's going to become a garden. And every year, we dug a few more feet, a few more feet until we got it all the way to the boulevard itself. But if you don't sow, if you don't plant, you will not have a garden. Amen. Number two, uh, a garden will grow by receiving the light of the sun. If there is no light, there is no garden. You've got to have the sunlight. That is why we look forward to spring when the world, our world has turned, the sun is in a better configuration to our lives, and all of a sudden our gardens spring back to life. They used to be dead, and then all of a sudden they spring back to life. That is because of the light of the sun. And the three, number three, the garden grows by receiving water that's through the rainfall. If, you're, you, if it doesn't rain, like it hasn't rained for probably a week where I live. I think other parts of Guelph may have received a little. But I tell you, yesterday I had to water the garden because, oh, they look so miserable. You know, the plants look like they just could not take another hour of the hot sun and the drought. So if we don't serve the garden water, we're not going to have a garden. Okay, and then number four, the garden will thrive by weeding. You've got to weed the garden, otherwise the weeds will overtake the garden, and all of a sudden, instead of having a garden, you have bush, a bush. You know, you're just in the wild, you know, as it were. So these are the four points that I wanted to talk about today, and I thought I was just going to go through them, one, two, three, four. What do you know? That is not the way the anointing works in me. I started on sowing and planting, and that is where I have to end today, because that's how it moved. And I suddenly realized that, you know what, uh, next week I will bring another word on this, and then I think uh, the other words will have to come Wednesday. So if you want to hear number three and four, you've got to join the Wednesday on Zoom so that you can get a full story, because today we are doing one. So the focus today is on sowing and planting. Now, Naresh will tell you that you've got to prepare the soil, right? That's right. You can't just, you know, plant anywhere, anyhow. You've got to prepare the soil, okay? So we go to Hosea 10 and verse 12, and this is what we find. It says, sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Such a beautiful scripture. I want you to look not at the first uh, line as it were, but it says, break up your fallow ground. You've got to break up the ground. It's, the ground is hardcore, okay? It's compacted. And you've got to break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is usually ground. It may have been planted before, but it was left to fallow. It was left for a season, and it's become hard again, hardcore again. Okay. So the, the scripture here is saying that you must break up your fallow ground. You have to break it up. And then it says, for it is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. You know, when you talk about breaking up the fallow ground, that's, that's hard work. That's hard work. You know, ground that has gone hard from not using it for a long time is growing hardcore stuff like thistles and, you know, all kinds of thorns and stuff like that are growing on it. You know, it's hard. And he says you've got to break it up. You've got to break it up. You know, this is not... Like your usual, oh, I carry on as usual in my Christianity. I show up every week for church, or I do my quiet time daily. No, when you think about breaking up your fallow ground, it's like taking a retreat. You know, it's like uh, um, entering a fast. You know, it's like time out with the Lord. Because you want to break up fallow ground. You want to present yourself before the Lord, and you want to ask him those questions that David would ask. Search me, O God. Know my heart. See if there is any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Why is this important? Is because we, we can tend to take things for granted. You know, we tend to choose what we like. 
We are, if you put food out here just now for me, I'm going to go for what I want. You know, some things I immediately identify. It's my good stuff. It's in my good place. It's in my comfort zone. It's the part of stuff I like. These are the scriptures I like. It's this kind of worship I like. You know, we have our stuff that we like. Okay, but when we break up our fallow ground, we are saying, what about those places that have gone fallow? Has my prayer life gone fallow? You know, am I just praying some few things, superficial prayers all the time? It, has my prayer life just gone the way of, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. I've never paused to say, God, what do you want? You know, so it is very important when you are preparing to sow, when a new growth season has come, that you take the time out to break up your fallow ground. You've got to realize that you, don't, you haven't necessarily checked all the boxes. You have most likely checked the boxes you like, but not necessarily every other thing. So the, the, the prophet here is saying, if you are getting ready to sow, take some time out now and break up the fallow ground. Break it up. Bring yourself before the Lord. You know, maybe, and check certain things. What's your giving like? You may have been showing up at all prayer meetings and all that, but your giving, what's it gone like? Are you giving? Are you sensing the need of other people? Are you releasing to bless other people? Because maybe unknown to you, you've become tight-fisted over the season because things were difficult somewhere along the line. So break up the fallow ground is good. It makes you come up before the Lord and ask him to search you. Now, God already knows when we ask him to search us, it's really about us knowing, right? It's the same thing about repentance. When we go to God for repentance, it's not because he doesn't know, but we, we use that process for things to come up in ourselves, for us to become aware of what needs to be changed. That is why repentance is such a great process. And to break up your fallow ground, it also takes repentance. Go and work the soil. Don't just assume that you are good. I'm the good girl. I'm the good, nice person. No, just go before God. And you know what? Listen to what he has to say to you. Be attentive and be willing to break up the fallow ground. Don't take things for granted. Sometimes we take things for granted. And uh, we need to break up our fallow ground. So we prepare the soil that way. And so I just encourage you, I ask the Lord, let this be very practical for all of us. So I, I will say to you, you know, take some time out with God. Take a weekend out just by yourself. Don't do the things you usually do. And just go before God and break up the fallow ground so that the ground can become productive again when the word of God falls upon it. It's going to be able to take root because the, broke, the fallow ground has been broken up. Amen. Hosea says we should break up. It's, why did he say so? He said, for it is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord for what does he want in this season? It is time to seek the Lord for that. We've come through two and a half years of a pandemic. Is it just going to be life as usual? Are you just going to go back to what you were doing before? Or do you have a curiosity in you, a desire in you? What does the Lord want for now? It is time to seek the Lord. Hallelujah. To find what his mind is for you and for me and for the season and for the community. What he wants. Let's not just do life as usual. Let's not just roll one day into the other. It is time to seek the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, in the parable of the sower, the outcomes of sowing the word of God depended on the soil. It didn't depend on the seed because the seed was incorruptible. But the outcome depended on the soil. What is the soil of my heart like? What is the soil of your heart like? Because the outcomes depend on it. Listen, a word can come in this moment and it will work differently on every heart. One person will be bored, like, huh, what's she talking about? You know, and, and, and that's it. It's gone already. Okay. And another person will say, hmm, I never thought about it that way before. Uh, one person will say, oh, that's what, exactly what I read last night. God is speaking to me. You see, so the way the word comes and the way it's captured, it depends on the soil of my heart and of your heart. Hallelujah. 
And the scripture told us, I can't read it because, you know, my time is going fast, but, you know, you can just go and read the parable of the sower because it's, it's a very popular one. You've heard it before by all means. So you just go and read it in the scriptures. I think it's Matthew 13, and you will find it. It's the chief of parables. Jesus called it the chief of parables. It's the parable upon which all other parables will be founded. So it says this. You see, when the soil was full of unbelief, there was absolutely no yield to the word of God. When there's unbelief, you can hear the word and it will do nothing in your life. Okay. And then he said, the word will not penetrate at all in a place where there's unbelief. It just does not even penetrate. It's just laying on the surface, waiting for a bird or something to come and pick it up and it's gone. Okay, and that's how Satan steals the word. That's why the Bible tells us to really intercede for people so that their hearts can become softened to receive a word. Okay, now the other kind of soil was a shallow soil. So the heart was very shallow. It talks about a superficial lifestyle. Everything is right there on the surface. Everything has to do with, uh, you know, the focus is on my ease. I mean, it, it, am I going to like this? Is it going to make me happy? Is it going to make me smile? You know, that kind of a life, that kind of a heart, that's just looking for ease. That's just looking for pleasure. And, you know, I just want to be well. I just, you know, that kind of a heart, okay, was the second kind of heart the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about. The focus is on ease. It's on comfort. It's on just good feelings. Does it feel good? You know, everything is about that. Does it feel good? If it feels good, I'm going to do it. If it doesn't feel good, I'm not going to do it. If it feels good to fast, then I'll fast. It never feels good to fast. So you're never going to fast, right? Does it feel good uh, to go for a three-hour prayer meeting? Hey, I'm tired. It doesn't feel good. You know, so when you live that life that's right on the surface, everything has to feel good or else it's out. That's the second kind of heart the Lord was talking about. He said, that word, even though it received the word, even though some few roots were generated, he said the word did not yield on account of trials and persecution. Every time it became a little bit hard, oops, you are gone, you are lost, we can't find you, you've lost interest. Every time it becomes a, why did God not heal me? So you are out. Why did God not do this? Why did he not do that? Because your good feeling cannot be met. And so what? You check out. That's the second kind of heart. It's just built on the superficial. Are all things going well for me? So he says, when trials and persecution come on account of the word, you know, the soil just aborts that seed and it's gone. And if the heart was filled, the third kind of heart was filled with worry and with all kinds of stuff, basically for worldly wants, needs, possessions. That heart is just checking what's in my bank account. Oh gosh, you know what? I've got to, uh, you know, I've got to buy a house. Oh, I'm so, uh, I need a second car. Oh, oh, you know, that school fees. The heart is always concerned about, these are things of life, it's important, but the heart is overly concerned. It's always checking those boxes. It's always looking to see what's in my bank account, what's happening here. Uh, you know what, is this good, is that good? Am I able to do this? Um, gosh, where's my next meal coming from? Oh dear, I'm not gonna be able to pay my mortgage. That heart is consistently focused on all of these things. Okay, and has no room for God because everything has to be these things. Oh gosh, and I need this, and I need that, and where's the girlfriend? How come I'm not in a relationship? Oh, you know, that heart is always just going around and around and around. And that heart, the Bible said, it chokes the word of God. It chokes the seed. You know, there are parts in my garden, I can see certain plants are choking certain plants. I can see it. Because they've overgrown. And I can imagine that their roots are in there, challenging the roots of the plants that were supposed to be in that space. And it's choking it. And it's choking it. And if that's your life and your lifestyle, then you are choking the word of God and the word will not bear fruit. Because your life is what? Too full. It's too full. Too full for God. Amen. 
Praise God. And in fact, the scripture says the deceitfulness of riches. Because when you have riches, it's the same thing. You're always checking what are your investments like? Are they yielding? Should I move my money from here to there? Should I buy this? More land? You know, that kind of thing is always working. So it says the deceitfulness of riches is also going to choke out the word of God. This is what the word of God says. Amen. So we need to what? Break up the fallow ground. That's why he said it's time to seek the Lord. Break up the fallow ground. Why? Because all of us are, you know, able to enter those zones. All of us can become too busy. We can become too shallow. All of us. Why? Because we are humans. We do have a carnality to us, a fleshly nature to us. So that is why we need to pause from time to time to break up the fallow ground. Break it up. Take a moment. Look at it. And look at your life and say, no, I'm not supposed as a believer, 21st century believer, this is not how I should lead my life. Where is the room for God? Where is the room for God? Hallelujah. And this goes to me and it goes to you because we are humans and these things pertain to our lives. Hallelujah. So he says, break up the fallow ground, prepare the soil. Hallelujah. Because the garden will grow according to what seed you put in it, but also according to the soil, the nature of the soil. And you know, sometimes, even here in Canada, thank God for University of Guelph, you can, I've taken a soil sample before for Naresh to, to, you know, investigate for me, is this soil too acidic? Because I was kind of thinking, what is happening to my lawn? And Naresh said, if you, if you bring me some soil, I will check it out for you. So we've got to check the soil of our heart. What kind of soil have you generated in your heart? Break up the fallow ground. So once you break up the ground, you've got to sow the right seed. You've got to sow the right seed. Listen to what Hosea says. Hosea says, sow for yourselves righteousness. That's what he said. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Sow so for yourselves the things that pertain to right standing with God. That's what you're supposed to sow. That's the seed that should go into the ground. Sow for yourself. So make up your mind. In this season, I'm seeking the Lord. What am I going to sow? Maureen, what are you going to sow? What are you going to sow in your life? What am I going to sow in this season? Sow for yourselves, he said, righteousness. What is right between you and God? Sow for yourselves righteousness. Hallelujah. Let's take a look at sowing. You know, in Genesis 129, this is what God said. See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So the seed is in the fruit and the fruit is in the seed, right? It's the same thing. The seed and the fruit are the same thing. But one is for sowing and one is for eating. That's it, okay? So the very thing that you need to reap in your life is what you need to sow. You know, if your, your life has become hardened where you can't sense God, you can't feel the presence of God, well, you need to sow into that presence of God. You need to make up your mind, I'm going to tarry in the presence of God. I'm going to take, uh, you know, I'm used to just doing it in my car, or I'm just used to just doing five minutes, but I'm going to make up my mind that I'm going to sow into the presence of God. So I'm going to increase the time, I'm going to wake up a little bit earlier, and that's what I'm sowing in order to reap that presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. So what you want to reap is exactly what you're going to have to sow. Because the seed is in the fruit, and the fruit is in the seed. Amen. And that is what you have to sow. Amen. Praise God. So it's important to sow the right thing. What is, you take a look at your life, you break up the fallow ground. You realize certain things. I have had no time for prayer. Well, sow prayer. I've had no time for the fellowship in the house of God. Well, sow the fellowship. Sow calling people up. So asking people how they are doing, sow it. Exactly what you want to reap is what you sow. If you're sitting and you're feeling very isolated, I have no friends, well, sow into friendship. Ask somebody to tea. Do something, sow. 
Because the seed is in the fruit and the fruit is in the seed. So you can sow that and you will reap it. In fact, the scripture says that. That if you sow friendship, you're going to reap friendship. Hallelujah. Praise God. So these are the things. What you want to reap is what you sow. And according to the scripture, he says, sow righteousness. Sow what God considers to be right. Okay, sow what? Prayer. Sow reading the Bible. Sow blessing people. So giving to the needs of people. Okay, so the word of God into somebody. And when you need it, a word will come to you. That is rhema. Okay, so so what is right? So kindness. You know, the scripture has told us really exactly what should be in our lives. You know, that thing is called the fruit of the spirit. Okay, so it's not even a mystery because it has been told us very, very, very obviously what, is, what should be in our lives. I want us to go to Galatians 5.16 and then 5.22. So Galatians 5.16 says this, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. If we have to walk in the spirit, then we have to sow walking in the spirit. How are you going to sow walking in the spirit? Well, you sow it by paying attention to the Spirit. You, you sow it by your prayer and your praise and your worship and creating that atmosphere in your home, in your car, and just taking time out for the Spirit. Even though you are at work, every half an hour you can check in with the Spirit. Hey, Holy Spirit, are you there? Holy Spirit, I bless you. Holy Spirit, rise up in me. Holy Spirit, explain this to me. Sow to the Spirit. Then you will walk in the spirit. That's it exactly. The seed is in the fruit and the fruit is in the seed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Verse 22 to 25 says, But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So you got to pay attention to the spirit. Do you go the whole day without checking in with the spirit? You just forgot everything about the Holy Spirit of God inside you. The whole day, the whole week maybe. And this is what he's saying. That we've got to walk with the Spirit. We walk with the Spirit, then we need to check in with the Spirit. The Spirit needs to be around. We need to feel the Spirit. We need to sense the Spirit. We need to check in with the Spirit. We need to say, rise up, Spirit of God in me. You know, and then he says, we should bear this fruit. Are you bearing the fruit of love? Joy. Is there joy in your heart? Or all that's in your heart is complaints, complaints, complaints because of things not going well. Even when things are not going well, we still are called to bear the fruit of joy. Hallelujah. The fruit of peace, we are called to bear it. You wake up, you are anxious. You know, this is happening, that is happening. You're supposed to bear the fruit of peace. What do you do? You calm yourself down, be still and know that I am God. So you be still and, and focus on God. And then recall all that he has done and his promises. Then the scripture tells us in the book of Philippians, have no anxiety. So you say to yourself, I am not going to have anxiety. Then it says, but in everything, by prayer and, and uh, supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So you take your time and make your request very clearly. Because most of the time when we are anxious, it's a muddled state. Sometimes we don't even know why we are anxious. It's just a muddled state. But God said, calm yourself down and bring the request up. Then you will know clearly what it is that is upsetting you. And then you will know you've told him, and therefore he's heard, so you can pick up your peace again and move in peace. You see, we need to uh, sow these things in our lives so that we reap them. If we don't sow, we do not reap. Amen. Praise God. So this is my encouragement to you about sowing according to the Spirit. Hosea says, sow righteousness. Righteousness is what you should sow. And then he said, you're going to reap what? In mercy. When you sow righteousness, you reap the mercies of God. The mercies of God is what will spring up as flowers in your garden, in the garden of your heart. The mercies of God. 
Any kind of mercy you need will be there because you are sowing in righteousness. You are sowing in your faith. You are sowing the word of God. So the mercies of God come to you. Your healing comes to you. Your provision comes to you. Friendship comes to you because you are sowing in righteousness. Amen. And the next point is sow bountifully. Listen, I tell you, this, when I was growing up, my mom had this kind of mentality that she kind of passed on to us, like little by little, like little by little. You know, there was always this kind of do things little, do things little. There was, I don't know, it was supposed to be some kind of uh, spiritual thing. You know, it's, it's, it's as if, you know that, uh, 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 like small is beautiful, okay? Now, I don't have any problem with small is beautiful, but big can be beautiful too. No, so, yeah, you've got to be careful about some of these things. Small can be beautiful, it's true, but big can be beautiful too. Amen? It's true. Okay. So, you've got to make sure, you've got to check yourself because maybe you are buying into that kind of thing. You know, oh, a little, a little, a little. My mom had that kind of thing. She, she taught us that kind of thing, that kind of way, you know. And I'm not saying it's all wrong because we have to be satisfied when things are little too. You know, we have to see the beauty in little things too. So I don't have a problem with that. But according to the scripture, as for sowing, sow bountifully. Sow a lot. Sow often. That's what the scripture says about sowing. Okay. And even though the scripture in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, which says, uh, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It has to do with giving, you know, in terms of giving offering, giving offering. Okay. So e even though it's about offering, it's also just about the things of this life. So bountifully, you know, I, I was in Ghana uh, uh, some years ago. I spent time with my a husband's uh, sister, and you know, she has a big family, so they cook a lot because her family has always got a big family. They live in a big house because they've got a big family, you know. And you know, she, she cooks a lot, and as a result, she cooks for other people too the neighbors, the street kids, whatever. You know, she sows bountifully. She doesn't say, oh, because my family is this large, I, I, it's really costing me. No, she's gone beyond. You see, we've got to learn how to go beyond. Sow bountifully. Sow the word of God bountifully into you. Come to church bountifully. Don't come to church once in six weeks. Sparing, sparing, everything a little. When it comes to God, a little, a little, a little. But in the world, you want to reap a lot, a lot, a lot. It doesn't happen that way. You are a believer. Sow into the kingdom a lot. Sow into the people of the kingdom a lot. Sow into church. Sow your energy into church. Sow your good wishes and your goodwill. Sow your volunteerism. Sow your money. Sow to people. Bountifully sow the word of God. Sow prayer. Sow it. Let them know you in heaven. Let them know she's up again. Hallelujah. Don't look at God and make it tiny and then look at the world and look for more. No, you are of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Praise God. So don't do church a little. This country is full of let's do church a little. No, let's do church a lot. Let's do conferences and all night meetings and fasting. Let's do it a lot. The world is dying all around us. Our church, our voices minimized so bountifully. Hallelujah. Don't let them squeeze you in a corner. You are at a workplace and you can barely raise your voice a peep to even say praise the Lord or anything because the whole culture has minimized you so a lot. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord so a lot. My time is up. I didn't even get to planting. Oh, Jesus. I'm still going. Planting. Most of us, we didn't sow our garden from seed. We buy the plants when they are little. Planting. Planting is important to God. We plant trees. Hardly do you see, 
If you see a tree that really grew from a seed, you already saw a forest. It grew before you got there, right? We go and buy the tree and we plant it, right? That's what we do. And God wants us to be planted in the house. I have to say this because if you want, you know, my, my neighbor, I have, I don't even know where's my left or my right because it depends which way I'm facing. But my neighbor, let's say on the right, has two trees in his backyard. And they have a covering shade. Myself, I tried to plant a tree in the backyard. It didn't work. But my tree in the front yard, after some resuscitation, it has survived. Then my neighbor on the left has a tree, but it's not such a covering tree. But the right, two trees. And it casts a shade so good and cool, it's even part of it falls on my backyard. And in these last few weeks of drought, everybody's grass is looking brown, but my neighbor's grass is still green. Why? Because of the trees and the shade that it cast on his lawn. Planting. God wants us to be planted in the house and he wants us to be oaks of righteousness. People that give a covering to other people. People with full fleshed branches, trunks and leaves that don't just cover us but covers other people. That when there's a drought, we provide a shade. That only happens with planting. And I will be ending soon, but Psalm 92 says this, verse 13 to 15. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. You will only flourish if you are planted. There is no flourishing without planting. The other day, I saw somebody stressed release on Facebook, you don't have to go to church to be with God. I say, yeah, you don't have to be. You don't have to go. You are saved all right, but if you want to flourish, you got to be planted. If you want to flourish, you got to be planted. You can be saved and never go to church. It's true. But if you want to flourish, you've got to be planted. That is what the scripture says. There is no lone ranger Christians who are flourishing. No, no, no. No, you've got to be planted. And this is what it says. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They are not going to go down minimized. No, 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 no. We will flourish to the end. We will flourish. We will have a swan song before we go. Right? Because we are in the house. We're going to flourish. And I, I fully intend to flourish to the last day. Oh, yes. Why? Because I'm planted in the house. And so are you. Amen. Praise God. He said, they shall be what? Fresh and flourishing. They shall be fresh. Oh, my goodness. Ah, to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. God is saying he will prove himself in the planted. There will be a testimony among those who are planted that God is true to his word. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. And you see, when you look at this, <laughs> if you look at this, Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. As is the manner of some. This thing was written how many years ago? Even then, there were Lone Ranger Christians then. That Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews had to address them. Don't be that. You have been addressed. Today, you have been addressed. Yes, I don't mind addressing you. Not forsaken. The assembling of ourselves. Not forsaken. If you didn't know, now you know. So if you choose not to, then you know you've chosen. Not forsaken. Hallelujah. Do not forsake. Hallelujah. Why? Why? I will go to Ephesians 4 and I will end with that. Paul says a lot about the church. He says a lot about the church. And he says, if you start from 4, he says, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of this deceitful plotting. Paul is saying that when we are in the church, when we are maturing, we cannot be tossed. We cannot be tossed by all kinds of strange teachings. People will say this today and it will knock us over on one side or the other side. No. 
But he says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. We, the church, we grow up not in some things, in all things. You alone cannot grow up in all things all by yourself. But the church together grows up in all things. We grow up in truth, in wisdom, in knowledge, understanding. We grow up in power, in healing, in miracles. We grow up together. Hallelujah. In all things, into him who is the head. Christ. And he says, from whom the whole body. He didn't say, from whom you alone. He didn't say that. From whom I draw alone. He didn't say that. He said, from whom the whole body, all of us, joined, joined. How can you be joined if you are just by yourself, sitting by your own self somewhere? Joined, he said. And knit, not just joined, but knit, knit. You know, a part of me has flowed into you. A part of you into me. I can't even separate myself from you. That's what it means by knitting. Okay, knit together by what every joint supplies. Your joint, my joint. We a body, hallelujah. What you are, I cannot be what you are, you cannot be what I am. It's that according to the effective working. God is looking for a body that is effectively working. He's not looking for an anemic body, half a body, a quarter of a leg. That's not what he's looking for. He says he wants what? The effective working by which every part, every part, does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Listen, you've got to be planted. In this season, we've got to be planted. The world needs us to be planted and strong and able and capable to affect it. The world needs us. Hallelujah. And I tell you, on that day, the Lord's going to ask you, don't think, don't think because of grace you won't be asked questions. Don't think so. Don't think so. Because we will all stand before him to be judged by our works of faith. And he said, it will be judged as though with fire. And only what is pure gold and silver will remain. But everything else will burn. But though you yourself will be saved as though through fire, you'll be standing in heaven smelling of smoke. Smelling of smoke. Because your works have bent. No, Lord, that will not be you. And that will not be me. It will not be you. It will not be me. We will stand there and the gold will be purified in the fire. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. I just want to encourage you today. How does your garden grow? How does your garden grow? How does your garden grow? Are you sowing? Are you planting? Are you planted? Hallelujah. I just want to say God bless you today. Let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we lift you up. Lord, we bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. I want to thank you for this word. I want to thank you that today, even today, you are breaking up fallow ground. And I pray that we will persist in the breaking up of fallow ground before you. And I pray, Lord, that we will each sow righteousness. We will sow your will. We will sow your instruction. We will sow your desire. We will sow what you've called right. We will sow the fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. That we may reap in mercies. In mercies. In the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that this word has not been condemning, but rather, oh God, challenging to people. I pray, oh God, that this word will make us understand, oh God, that you are building something. You are the master gardener, and you are using us as your under gardeners, hallelujah, to fashion the kind of garden that is impactful in our own lives, in our family lives, in our communities, in our cities, that our gardens will truly beautify our generation. So, Father, as we have brought this to a close, I pray that each and every one of us will be empowered, hallelujah, to sow and to build that kind of garden. Oh God, that has you in the center. We bless you and we give you praise. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. <laughs>